All right, Rick is ready to go, and so am I. So let's let's get started. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Rolando Scott. Um, I am a currently a development manager at Teori, which is a DC Drupal-based creative firm. I manage a backend team of eight incredible and awesome devs. Um, I've been a Drupal enthusiast since Drupal 6, so more than a decade ago. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm currently based in San Jose, Costa Rica, and I'm also a volunteer for a firefighter. So, uh, you know, I fight Drupal fires by day and real fires by night, sometimes the other way around. Um, this session is directed to developers, project managers, any, anyone who interacts with the admin interface of Drupal. And while most of what I'm saying uh, will definitely apply to Drupal 9, it is focused to Drupal 8, so word of caution there, right? So what brings us here today? What is configuration management, and why does it cause a lot of frustration to a lot of folks out there? Um, I'm tempted to use that voice that always comes on on these silly infomercials. You guys know the one, right? It's, do you have constant issues changing settings on the production side? Do your changes suddenly disappear when somebody else commits code? Is there even any hope for me? Well, I've got good news for you. In reality, this guy seems like someone who's trying to manually synchronize three different environments by recreating each single change. It's either that or it's someone who just learned how to use their arms recently. But it can feel like that. Having a site that has different instances that aren't connected in, in any way is hard to maintain. Configuration management is what helps us keep them in sync. So let's start defining what it is. Right? Configuration is the collection of admin settings that determine how the site functions, uh, as opposed to the content of the site. Configuration will typically include things such as the site name, the content types, fields, taxonomy, vocabulary, views, and so on. We'll get into what exactly is configuration in a bit. So in practice, this means that we can import an export configuration of a site into another site and have a clone of how that site works without having to copy the database to sync the content in any way, right? Uh, we can, with confidence, test new features on a development environment and know that if it works there, it works on the long side, right? And again, since the settings get saved to files, we could add them to a version. That means we can have a comprehensive history of what change was made by whom and when. Basically, we know who to blame when the site fails. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't work, but yeah, it's, it's all part of it. Um, one of the most common questions and frustrations that derive from the fact is that we don't always know or understand what constitutes a configuration change and what doesn't, right? So let's start with the easy ones. Any content type and fields is a configuration change. Any change made into the, in the configuration screen of the admin, which can you know, vary depending on the modules and functionality that you have on your site. Um, any web form, any menu, views, display modes, all of that is configuration changes. Some easy ones that aren't are um, any content, right, that's added through a content type, um, any blog page, any home page, any basic page, et cetera. Any web form submission is not configuration any file, any type of media, and the menu modes, right? So these are two, are, are very simple, right? To understand which one is a configuration, which ones aren't. But there are some that are uh, iffy, right? Um, for example, taxonomy, taxonomy vocabularies are, but the taxonomy terms are not. So this sometimes creates issues on sites that use taxonomy terms as structural building blocks instead of just ways to categorize content. So for example, let's say you have a product, right? And the product has uh, colors, red, green, and blue. And then that is the taxonomy vocabulary. You can filter, um, you can filter through that color. You can add that product and select green, red, and blue, perfectly fine. You don't have an issue. But if you create your site in a way where um, I don't know, red is a whole section of the site, right? And that uh, displays content underneath, and that has uh, custom functionality assigned to it. When you're importing the configuration, if that color doesn't exist already, right, it may become an issue because then your other custom modules are kind of waiting or, or looking for that term, and it doesn't exist, right? So that, that's one of the, 
parts where it gets iffy. And the other one, like like Rick is mentioning right now, and it is a very common one. I think we've all, at some moment or another, had seen this uh, error: is that content uh, blocks um, the the content setting is configuration, but the content block isn't, right? Um, so what that means is if I, on my local, create a block, right, create a, a, a custom block, and I add some text in it, and I place it on the header, right, and I export configuration, when I'm importing a configuration to the destination site, Drupal is going to say, oh, okay, great, there is a block that needs to go into the header of the site. The problem is I don't have it because the, the content of the block isn't there, right? I don't have that block. I know there's a block that needs to go in there. I just don't have that block. Uh, so what it does, it throws this error. And like Eric just says, it's sometimes not very straightforward to understand why that's happening. Why, why would why wouldn't I import a block? Why doesn't it just appear, right? It's, it, like is it configuration? Is it content? Like so, there's ways to mitigate that, which we'll which we'll um, we'll talk in a little bit. Um, as a little history, uh, back in the good old days, and I say that kind of sarcastically because Drupal has definitely gotten better with each version change, um, we used to uh, use a module called Features to export bundles of changes from one instance to another. So while this was effective, it had a bunch of downsides. Um, first of all, it wasn't enforced, right? So you could use it if you wanted, but another developer could come in and not use it, which would cause issues, right? Uh, secondly, it wasn't supposed to be used site one. So you could only do it in small bundles of configuration without it getting too messy and hard to manage. And the most important downside is that it wasn't made for this purpose. Like features was great for creating bundles of configuration to replicate on another site. For example, I created a blog, I added some fields, I added some display modes, um, you know, I can add an image, I can add a date, I can do all that, and I say, wow, this is really good. I don't want to have to do this on every single site. Let me uh, bundle this up as a feature and import that into uh, another site. And but that was it. That's a one-time thing, right? It's a one-time thing. On the other site, um, another developer could come in and add more features or change anything that they wanted to. So it was just a one-time thing. Uh, so that would obviously cause issues when trying to maintain uh, sites synced up. Uh, thankfully, configuration management became a thing in this way. So we keep talking about configuration files, but let's dive deeper in what to, what's in one of those files, right? What, what exactly is it uh, that gets ex exported? A configuration file is a YAML file, right? The YAML file is a human-readable data serialization language. Um, it, all, every single YAML file starts with a universal uh, unique identifier at the top. It basically means that you can create a, let's say it's a content type of configuration, one way. And it's exactly the same way as some um, in another site. It's created exactly the same way in another site. It still doesn't have the unique ID. So Drupal knows that this file specifically is for my site and not for any other site. It's specifically for my site, even if certain parts or all of it is exactly the same as another place. Right? Um, inside the files, there's IDs, language options, statuses, labels. Uh, dependencies, which is always important, right? If, if I need something to be able to run this part of the site, uh, what is it exactly that I need? And Drupal needs to figure out that both things are installed and working correctly. Um, it's basically, in, in the short term, it's basically everything that Drupal needs to run that specific configuration or section of the site. When you install a new module, these modules bring additional configuration files to your site. So the bigger your site, uh, the more functionality it has, the more configuration files your site has. Uh, during the installation, the site grabs those configuration files as building blocks for that section. But when you export that configuration, the config files become part of your site. So the configuration is owned by the site and not by the new modules. All right, so now we know what a configuration files are, uh, are and what's in them and what changes on the site can be seen as configuration. Let's learn how to work with them, right? Uh, the first crucial thing we need to understand is that when creating a configuration change on the site, that does not automatically create a configuration file. You need to manually force the site to do this. You need to tell Drupal, hey, I need these files, and uh, I need the configuration, the current configuration, in, in files. This is important to note because issues arise when your team doesn't have a workflow in place. 
Although workflows can vary depending on the team and the project, there are definitely two main approaches to using configuration manager, right? So the first one is using the Drupal admin user interface, right? The Drupal configuration management unit user interface has three main sections. Uh, the first section is the overview page that can tell you if all your configuration is in sync with what is in stage in the files. Like I just mentioned, creating a setting on the, as, on the site does not automatically create a new configuration file. When that happens, we call that the configura configuration is not in sync. The overview page will tell you exactly what section isn't in sync and can even tell you the difference between what's live on the site and what's staged on the file. Right? You can click on the little button that says view differences and it will tell you, hey, you know, on, on the file it says that this should have this title, but on the current live site it has this title, for example. Uh, with the press of the button, we can reset the site to match what the files uh, say the site's configuration should be and wipe out any change that's been done on the site um, completely. It's important to note that, as in most things in Drupal, there isn't a back or an undo button. Right? So pressing that button can definitely be very disruptive. You can literally take hours of work uh, and just completely you know, add them as if they were never there. Uh, the other sections of the UI allow you to export the site's current configuration. This includes any changes that are not in sync. So basically, it grabs the files that are already exist, it grabs anything you've done, and it packages it all up and, um, and gives you a tar file. Um, this process is useful, again, for grabbing all these configuration file, files and maybe pushing them to another instance of the site or adding them to your repo, depending on what you're using. Um, so that way the code gets changed, I'm sorry, the, the changes get saved into the code of your website. Uh, after clicking the button, you get prompted to download that tar file and it has all the configuration files in that one main file. The import section uh, can import that tar file that you just exported, uh, but depending on how your site is configured in the hosting you might use, you might not be able to use the import directly. Um, some hosting providers don't allow you to do changes to the site without um, actually making a change to the repo, so um, they won't allow you to import the file directly. Again, it depends on your workflow and where you have your site configured. Um, so if you're looking for some, oh, and both options, the export and import function, functions, uh, allow you to see a single item as well. So if you're, for some reason, wanting to look at, I don't know, one of your sites and say, this is weird, I, I want to know how this specific section is configured, you can look at, um, you can look at the, at the, the, the single file that you're looking for and see that line change and say, oh, okay, right, I understand what this is now. So you can look at one single file at a time, or you can export all of them directly. The other option is using Drush. Uh, for those who might not know, Drush is a command line uh, shell and scripting interface for Drupal. It basically allows developers to do several actions directly in our terminal windows um, versus clicking buttons on the UI. Uh, we can flush the cache, we can make database backups, we can run cron and many other things. And this also includes importing and exporting configuration, right? So using Drush, we have uh, two commands. We can import and export. Uh, there's the full version. That's the first thing on the left that says Drush config export. And there's the short-handed version or alias version, which is just Drush CEX, which is what we developers normally use. Uh, when you run these commands, it will tell you exactly what it is you're importing or you're exporting and give you a chance to confirm just to make sure that you want to overwrite the files or you want to import this into the site. Um, they end up working very similar to, to using the UI. It's just one of those things where, you know, it might you might be more comfortable using a terminal window than using the, the user interface or the other way around, right? Uh, with that being said, I want to talk a little bit of how the workflow works in Teodi, how we manage it, right? So we as developers have a local instance of the website. We create our changes locally. Let's say we create a config type, right? Uh, we add some fields, we add whatever configuration that's needed for that. We export that configuration via Drush. So we're telling Drupal that all the changes that we just did, we want to make sure there's files to, you know, for the, the configuration files for those set, uh, those changes actually exist, right? So uh, we export the configuration, we commit and push the files up, um, and then we use a continuous integration tool called CircleCI that grabs those files, grabs the commit, um, 
and rebuilds the site on, on our dev um, instance and imports the configuration automatically. So that means dev always has the latest files and the configuration is imported automatically each time we push to, to dev, right? And this is important to consider regarding workflows, right? If a website setting is changed, but the sync configuration and that configuration setting isn't there, Drupal will delete that setting, right? So using a real world example, if you go into, let's say, the prod environment and create a web form, right? And you add some fields and add other settings. If the configuration files of that web form aren't exported and saved, the next time someone imports that configuration, all that work that was done on the web form will be wiped out. When syncing, anything that isn't in the files gets wiped out. And it, it seems kind of weird, but it actually serves a great purpose because, for example, let's say we have a site and we created a content type, and then you know clients will be clients and they say, oh no, we don't we don't need that content type anymore. We're like perfect, we we'll just take it out, right? So the configuration files for that content type are no longer in there. So when I import that uh, configuration in another instance of the site, Drupal is going to say, hey, OK, so I have this content type here. There's no longer files supporting it and configuring it. Great, I'm just going to delete it. Right? So it makes sense for things that aren't in configuration to be deleted, but you don't always want that. right? You don't always <laughs> want uh, everything that the current site settings have to have to be currently deleted. right? So this. The, um, the ability for configuration to completely wipe out sections, um, if you're not careful, can create issues. Let's, let's talk about these issues and things we need to consider, right? So the number one issue that happens is when changes are made directly to the different environments without exporting the code, right? That is definitely the number one issue is we see it. Uh, we try to teach everybody about it. We try to make sure it, it, it doesn't happen, but you know, sometimes it does happen. So I'll go in and, and do a quick change for the title because the client wanted it and I didn't want to go through the whole process of changing the code and exporting and doing all that. So I just changed it directly on the on the admin interface. Uh, when somebody else syncs code, right? Um, they if they're not careful, when they sync the, the code, and since my change isn't in code, right, it'll get wiped out. This is what we were just talking about. Uh, and then another issue that sometimes happens is the configuration is actually never synchronous. So the different instances are not consistent. Uh, we had a, <laughs> an, a client that um, that had three uh, three building environments in Aquia, right? Uh, dev, test, and I think they call it prod, right? And um, the developers that created that type for them never used configuration environments. Uh, configuration management, I'm sorry. They did a change on test, the client would approve it, they would then manually do the change again on um, test, the client would approve that, and then they would manually do it again on, on, on the live site. Obviously, after a while, you know, that that methodology is very error prone, right? They're, they're, it's really hard to remember exactly what you did on dev, right? And recreate that manually by clicking on the back end sections. And you know, and then again, do it on live, right? So the client, when they came to us, they could. They, one of the very, very first things they said is, you know, our site is kind of weird because certain things work well on test, but they won't work. They don't work well on live, or, or the other way around, right? That it works well on live, but when I try to test something on dev, it doesn't work. Um, so it's just all wonky, right? It's all weird, and you know, it's not in in sync. And of course, I went in into the configuration management screen. That's the first thing I did. And there were like 467 items that were different. <laughs> and uh, that basically means that the configuration was never synced, right? So they have these, these issues that would have been really easy to, to not have them by the other clients, that, uh, by the other development company that, that created the site, uh, if they had just used configuration management, right? If they had actually used what Drupal 8 provides them with. Um, the incre incredibly hard part for us was we wanted to do things right, right? So we wanted to start doing configuration management, but we couldn't just grab what was on live and use that as an example because the client was very specific that there were certain things that they liked how it worked on test, and there are certain things that they liked how they worked on dev. So we kind of had to cherry pick, you know, parts of configuration here and there uh, to be able to uh, get the site on dev. Uh, test and prod uh, to be exactly synced up. And, you know. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about things that you shouldn't. Right? So again, avoid making configuration changes on the live Drupal site, right? Another thing to consider are clients are clients, right? And they will do things. And at the end of the day, it is their site. Right? They will, you know, if you give them the option of being able to create a form or being able to change some of the settings on their site, you need to prepare for that. You need to make sure that any time you are uh, going to push the latest code up to live, you already took a look at the configuration screen and said, hey, is this blank? If it's blank, then you're great. That means that your configuration is in sync with what you know, it is in files, and your push is not going to do anything bad. It's not going to destroy anything. But if there are differences, you're going to need to see if you recreate those or what is, is going on, right? There might be differences that, you know, the, it might not matter. Like maybe you just, you know, find change something and they didn't really even want it. Or it wasn't really important. Or it might be something really big. So before you synchronize uh, the code on the live uh, site, you need to uh, see those changes and add them into your code um, to make sure that when you synchronize, it includes whatever the client had done or anybody else had done on the live site. Uh, that is one of the things. The, the other thing that we shouldn't do, there are certain instances where it might make sense, but for the most part, don't make any changes to the, the configuration files directly. Uh, Drupal knows exactly you know, the correct formatting, the spacing, the titles, et cetera, that needs to go in there. Uh, any change that needs to be done to the configuration files should be done in the Drupal backend as a, as a best practice. Right? So I'm going to briefly touch on the different hosting providers. Um, because even though every Drupal site 8 works the same, uh, depending on the hosting provider you have your site on, the way configuration works might change a bit. So again, not going to go down specifically on the changes in each one. But do you know that your workflow and the way you synchronize configuration might change depending on where your sites are hosted on? Uh, Panthon, which is what we use at Teodi, is very um, easy to use. There's only one configuration folder um, by default, and what a configuration that's on dev is on um, test, it's on live, right? It's the same folder. Acquia, I know that it has a different way of having two different um, folders, right, for, for configuration, and there's specific commands to uh, synchronize configuration one way or the other. And uh, so this platform is such, right? They're, they're very straightforward. So it's very important for your team, not only the developers, but the project managers and basically anybody that touches the site to know and understand where your site is hosted and the differences, right? That type of concept. Um, one of the things I, did, I, I wanted to get into as well is that configuration management on its own is great, but it might not, uh, you know, it might not solve every issue you, you might have with it, right, or, or want to extend it. So there are some great contributed modules that can extend the functionality of configuration management. Uh, first one is configuration read-only mode. <laughs> I, I this, this module is a little bit draconian, right, because what it does is basically it locks the site uh, in a way where there can't be any configuration uh, or any setting change that would trigger a configuration file, right? So you would never have the example I talked about earlier, right, about, oh, the client came in and made some changes and the configuration is out of sync. It won't allow the, the, the client to do that. Right? They will only be allowed to add content. They will only be allowed to change, you know, menu links and stuff like that. But they will never be allowed to actually change any setting that could make a, a configuration change. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, it's iffy, right? Because at the end of the day, we have to understand that these are client sites, right? at least for an agency like ourselves. Right? If, if you guys own the site, completely different. But if for an agency that we work with several different clients, it's hard to tell a client, hey, here's your site, this is yours, but you can't really do a lot with it, uh, just except adding code, right? I'm sorry, adding content. Uh, you can't really change how it works or do any type of setting. Kind of defeats the purpose of having a CMS in the first place, right? But it's up to you guys. Uh, configuration split is another great module because there are it's, there are times where you want to have certain configuration work in dev and in test, but not in prop. Right? Uh, I'm sure yeah, there's development modules, for example, that you want them to run in dev and test, but not in prod environment. And you don't want to have to synchronize your code and then turn them off each single time. Right? So configuration split basically 
allows you to have different sets of configuration for different environments. It's a very useful module, which I recommend to, to everybody. There's another uh, module called Recreate Lock Content, which basically solves the issue we talked about before. Uh, what it does is it um, when you import a block, it actually creates the block for you. It's empty, right? Because the content is something that you need to do, but it creates the block, right? So you will never get that error of, hey, the block, I have a, a settings for a block, but I don't have the actual block content. You know, here's an error. Um, what it does is just creates that block automatically for you, so you can just go in and, and copy the content from where you know wherever you were importing. It just had new content or whatever, but it solved that issue. That's a that's also a great module. Uh, configuration ignore is something similar to configuration split. It uh, allows you to ignore certain configuration um, files depending on your environment. Uh, quick and easy example. For example, if I want my dev and test uh, environments to have, for the site to have a certain title, for example, uh, but I don't want that to move up once I hit prod, then I can have that. So we know that the prod environment is just going to completely ignore that configuration file and we'll always have you know whatever whatever setting is currently added at, at the live site. Um, another uh, great module is configuration menu link. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, menus, the actual menu, the creation of the menu, the existence of the menu is a configuration file, right? But the links aren't, right? The links aren't. And a lot of times it happens that, you know, links on those menus are also an integral part of your site. They, you know, that we have sites that have 200 links. And maybe we don't want to change those, right? Or we don't want to make it in a way where, you know, some of those links have to exist. Right? So we can add them to the configuration. So when we push those up, those links always exist and they're saved into the code. So that's one of the you know, uh, modules that can help. And the last one is structure sync, uh, which is one which should also kind of help um, with the issue I talked about about taxonomy isn't used as a way to filter content, but it's actually used as a building block of the site and added functionality. Structure sync allows you between other things to actually uh, do uh, cre sync the taxonomy terms along with the taxonomy vocabulary. Right? It, it does both things. Uh, it's just like the menu link, but uh, it's, it syncs the, the taxonomy terms as well. So um, those get saved into the code, and you can make sure that once you push the taxonomy vocabulary, the terms also exist, and you won't have any issues with anything that depends on a specific uh, taxonomy term. Um, so let's just uh, talk about some key takeaways from, from this session. Um, configuration management is a great thing to have, right? It should be a must use if your site is used, on, if your site has more than one instance, which should almost always be the case, right? I, I know that you know, there's some people that like to live on the edge, right? And, and have one single instance of the live site and that's it. But uh, for most people and, you know, um, and agencies and, and any type of environment, you should have a development version of your site um, just to play around with and make sure things work correctly. Uh, and if you do, then you should use configuration management to make sure that an instance and the live instance is in sync. Uh, and now that we know, understand how to import and export and why changes get wiped out, we can avoid having the issues, right? We can avoid having uh, the repetitive issues that, hey, I made a change and it's no longer there, or hey, the client made a change and <laughs> it disappeared, uh, basically. So uh, with that being said, I think I'm just in time. Um, any questions? I, I saw a couple of questions. I'm going to go up through the chat and um, and see if I can find any, any questions along. Um, let's see. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Costa Rica is pretty beautiful. If you guys ever want to come down here, please do. Uh, it's 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 pretty good. It's uh it's very friendly for Americans as well. Mostly everybody speaks English. Uh, you can pay with dollars everywhere. It's, it's great. <laughs> and you can ping me, and I'll make sure we can go grab a beer or something. Um, okay. So Charles saying there that there was a sound drop. Oh, James kind of answered it already. But no, you there is no undo button to import. If for some reason you don't have that configuration saved in your repo, uh, 
and you're just doing changes, um, you know, the client made changes, and you're going to uh, think you're the changes that you have in Tenor, there is no undo button. Like if, if you do that, you're they're basically lost, and you would have to maybe take a look at a backup or some other way to restore what the client did, or you know, kind of bite the bullet and say, hey, uh, <laughs> whatever you had done, we kind of have to do that again. Um, let's see. Um, any other questions around here? Oh, Max says, okay, so there is a, a case where um, there was a, a reason to edit the, the YAML file directly. Um, it, it's, it, I mean, there there has to be a better way, right? That the, the fact that you had to do that means that ECK needs to make sure that every, uh, every setting it provides is actually something that you can edit through the to the UI. I mean, I think that makes sense uh, for the most part. Maybe not every setting, but uh, most settings should be, uh, you should be able to change everything through the UI, right? So you don't specifically have to do that because again, it, it, can, it can lead to errors. Um, all right, so Charles, okay, great. Um, configuration batch export. Okay, that, that's okay. That's the Julie. Julie's talking about a configuration batch batch export module, uh, where I'm guessing her current configuration folder is massive, uh, so the site doesn't time out. It uses batches to, to import and synchronize configuration. That's a that's a great module, uh, Julie. Thank you. Uh, yep, Max is saying that structure sync created some issues. Kevin also said that uh, configuration menu link had some issues. Bank exports. I think so. You know, the general things to watch out whenever you're using a contributed module, right? Um, maker. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I will post the link to the slides in the Madcamp Slack if that is something. Or um, let me let me just um, put my email right here. Uh, if you guys send an email to me, this is my email. Uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, present the, give you guys the slides and answer any other additional question that you guys might have uh, in terms of configuration. Um, if you're following best practices, you should never have to export your entire configuration from your product by a person. Um, question, can you walk through the steps to do an export and generate the files to be able to check into your repo? Um, sure, let's see you. What should we do? Um, Julie, just as a, as, a, as a thing for me to know, would you be using uh, the UI to export the, the configuration, or would you be using Crush? So I think that's, uh, I mean, it's either one or the other, and it, you know the, the process varies a little bit. But let's say you're using the UI, right? So over here where it says, export right you would click on that tab it gives you a button to download right that that button that downloads uh a tar file which is like a zip file right it's a, comp a compressed file that has a bunch of configuration files in them um let's see and generate the files to be able to check into okay great so what you do is you grab that file you uncompress it, unzip it, whatever you want to call it, and you get to the folder that actually has all those files, right? What you can do then is just you grab those files and you copy and paste that into the configuration folder of the site that you're working on, right? Um, if you're 100% sure that, you know, your local environment where you have the files is in sync with, um, with the version that you're working on, then you can just go ahead and empty the, config, uh, the site configuration folder and just copy all your files in, just to make sure every change that you do gets you know put in. That, that whatever you had on, let's say dev, and you push the configuration files out of there, you exported the files out of there to make sure that what you're going to uh, add to your repo is exactly that. Then you would go in and delete everything in your configuration file and add the the files from the export. When you're committing those files into the code base, uh, it will tell you the differences, right? It will say, hey, this file is new. Hey, this file is modified. 
or if you deleted something on the dev side, right? And when you exported the files, it'll say, hey, this file is missing as well, right? And that way you will know that, um, that yeah, you know, the changes you made are gonna go into the, in the code repo. Now, what happens after that depends on the workflow that you guys have, right? It, when you push that change up to a master or whatever environment you guys have, then you might need to, well, you won't have to synchronize if you're coming from there, right? Because the, what, what you just pushed to code is exactly what's on the dev environment, let's say. Uh, but I mean, it, it, it all depends afterwards on, on what you need to do and you know, on your on your current workflow. And when using the UI, you have to manually extract and copy the files with the grid photo of monitor and get. Exactly, right, exactly. Uh, or, yeah, I mean, that is one thing, like, all right, so there's two things, right? Uh, yes, Julie, you do have to do that. Um, one of the, the main, you know, takeaways from this is that doing a, a, a change in setting does not automatically generate that those files, right? You have to tell Drupal, hey, please generate a configuration file for all the changes that I've done, configuration files. So, yeah, you grab those and put those into the code. And, yes, Kristen, you can do that as long as you um, you have that local version of your site um, running on your site, right? If, because there, there's times where you only have the repo and you have the files, but you're at, you aren't actually running the site locally, right? You just have the repo. So um, you know, it, it happens to me where sometimes I have to make uh, a change on a site that I don't usually work on. So I don't want to go to all the trouble of actually getting that site to work on my local. Um, I just want to do it quick and easy, so I make the change on dev, I export those changes, and then I just add them to the file repo. So I don't have a UI to put that um, to put that tar file in, right? If you do, that's it's great. But uh, uh, I just put them in in the, in the files and the repo files and push them up, and know that now my changes that I did on dev are now part of the, of the files. And you know, once that gets pushed to test and live, it'll go up there with them. Um, well, Drush put them in the right place, yes. Uh, that is correct. When you export configuration using Drush, it pushes them to, I mean, unless you have something weird or, or really wonky, but by default, it will definitely put those in the right place. So you export using Drush, and then you're able to commit right away those 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 files that will be in the right place. Good point, now the box config does go inside, the which is ideal, you have to customize. Yep, that is, Rick has a great point. Um, we, as a, at Teori, we, we have the configuration files uh, one level above the Drupal site files. Uh, so they're never, they're, you can't access them directly. And yeah, it's one level above root, which is exactly uh, what Rick is saying. That is a great way uh, to do it. That is something you need to specify. Uh, but again, it's part of the workflows that your team needs to decide, right? It's a good thing to do. It's not necessary to do but it's something that, that you need to specify. Yes, exactly, in the settings now, that is correct. Thank you, Kristen. Um, question, any best practices considering for where to keep the demo? All right, we just talked about this. Um, so nice to look in. Yep, yep, that, that is perfect, yep. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's like, that's what we do. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't, I don't particularly think those files should be accessible via web browser, right? Um, Drupal doesn't need them to be. And just keeping them one level above root, uh, like Rick said, is is definitely ideal. That's something uh, we do now. The reason I would think that Drupal doesn't do that by default is that um, we don't. Not every single environment has access to a level above root, right? There's some very simple uh, hosting environments that you basically get, you know, where the site files are. That's all you get. Uh, so you know. Forcing that would cause issues for those type of users. So it's better to you know have that well, we're 100% sure it works for everybody. And then specific user cases like ours, um, we, we just know that. Um, great, uh, Julie. <laughs> um, um, I am um, I <laughs> appreciate that so much. Uh, I put my email there. Feel free to ask any questions. Uh, uh, if you want the slides, just shoot me an email. I will love to get them to you. Uh, one thing I did want to mention real quick is that Teori is looking, uh, we're looking for new developers. So if you're looking for uh, a new backend, if you're looking for a new backend or, or frontend uh, job, it's 100% remote uh, all the time, not just now in the pandemic. So 
um, you know, if, if, if you're looking for a change of pace, then just go ahead and check Coyote. Uh, the last things I will say uh, now that we're done, thank you again very much. Um, these are the next sessions that are coming up, you know, 12 at noon uh, to noon, 12.30, event meet and greet with Ann and Jen. There's also a part two of living wisely, maintaining balance and meeting under modern conditions. And uh, 1 p.m., the contribution lounge. And these are the next sessions um, coming up. Uh, you have them right there. Hope you guys continue enjoying Bad Camp. It's been a pleasure and an honor for me to talk to you guys. Uh, please stay in touch. And uh, thank you very much again. I think uh, pretty much it.